Hi, I'm Dr. Ed Kershey from Antioch Baptist Bible College in Cartersville, Georgia, and we're going to have a Bible study today out of Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And if you can, if you have a ability to get your Bible, get your Bible, and we're going to follow it right along and uh, see what it is. This is a passage that's familiar, and uh, it's it's a sermon that Jesus spoke. It's a story that Jesus spoke, and uh, we need to study it a little bit in depth today. If you follow along, verse 19, there was a certain man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And he desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to, to us that would come from hence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, Thou, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses or the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. A couple of months ago, I was reading this, and I've heard it a long time. We, we, we preached it lots of times, studied it, and uh, but I, I was approaching it a little bit different way. As I was reading it, I was thinking about Jesus's motive. Why would Jesus preach on the subject of hell? I didn't write this. This is in the Bible, just like I read it to you. And why would Jesus preach on a place called hell? Now, as I read it, I was looking for keys. Could I get some indication? And I noticed right off that the word torment is used repeatedly. In verse 23, it's in the plural, torments, this uh, being in torments. In verse 24, Cool my tongue, for I am tormented. In verse 25, he says, He is comforted, and thou art tormented. And then in verse 28, And to this place of torment. Four different times, Jesus uses relatively the same word. It involves two different Greek words. But uh, you can study that out. But it, 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 why would Jesus preach on hell? And why would his topic on hell include torments? As I studied this passage and I looked, I was looking for what kind of torments? What kind of torments are in hell? And is Jesus aware of them? And if he is aware of them, which I believe he is, is Jesus, did Jesus preach this sermon because he doesn't want you to go to hell. Now, I have 12 points, 12 different torments that I see in this story, in this passage of the Bible, and it's like Jesus is saying, pleading with you that hear this, please don't go to hell. You won't like it. 
you won't want to be there. Please don't go to hell. That's why Jesus took time to preach on the subject of hell. I know it's not a popular subject, and a lot of preachers avoid it. They say, well, we don't want to offend somebody. We don't want to scare anybody. It looks like to me Jesus, at this point, didn't mind offending somebody or scaring somebody to a degree. You need to know that hell is a real place that Jesus talked about, and he doesn't want you to go there. Not only does he not want you to go there, I don't want you to go there. And uh, uh, according to the Bible, there's people that die every day and go to a place called hell. Modern translations don't even like the word hell. Sometimes they use Sheo and Hades, and that comes from the word. And I wonder, I said, if, if the new translations are trying to help us to understand the Bible, why don't they just use the word hell? That's not a word that we have a problem understanding, most of us. And, uh, but they go back to the Hebrew and the Greek and uh, try, to, try to bring up that, those words. But let me show you in this passage 12 torments that I found in this story that I want to share with you. The first one, you don't want to go there. And look what it is. Number one in verse 23. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. In hell. Being in hell is a torment unto itself. Being in a place that's separated from God, being in a place that all these other things don't mean, just being there. Now, according to the Bible, we only find two places you can go when you die, heaven or hell. I know other religions have invented other places, uh, at least four of them, five, six, seven, eight. They come up with all kinds of them, and, uh, but according to the Bible, there's only two places you can go, heaven or hell. Jesus preached this sermon because he doesn't want you to go to hell. I'm sharing it with you. Please don't go to hell. If in hell, you're going to find out that it's a real place. Don't wait to get there. It might be too late. The second thing is seeing. In verse 23, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. You're going to have the ability to still see. Seeing has got to be part of our spirit and soul makeup, and most of us associate with our body, but here's a man whose body went to the grave, his soul and spirit went to hell, and he could still see. And in this story, it's going to relate a number of things that he saw. He saw Abraham, he saw Lazarus, he saw the flame, he saw water, he saw all kinds of things, and... Uh, but you still have the ability to see. Seeing doesn't stop at death. Once you go over on the other side, you will still have the ability to see. And what will you see in hell for eternity? That's how long the Bible teaches you're going to be there. The same Greek and Hebrew words for how long some people are going to be in heaven, the same words are used for how long people are going to be in hell. So if you say we're going to be in heaven forever and ever and ever, same same idea, people are going to be in hell forever and ever and ever. You can't this, the, divide those terms into meaning this or that. So you're going to be in hell, you're going to be seeing. And then it says in verse 24, and he cried. He cried and said, Father Abraham, you're going to have the ability in hell to cry. Now there's different aspects of crying. I had a write-up a paper for a court one day, and I said, I, I, I cry to, to, the, to you, you know, saying something. And that, that's a different form of crying. And some of us boo-hoo big time, some of us just whipper. But in hell, you're going to maintain the quality of hell. Now, I, I'm 70 years old, and like most of my generation, Daddy told me men don't cry. Well, Daddy, men do need to cry, but we don't cry like women cry or like little girls cry. But we need to cry. Guess what? That's not going to cease. If nothing ever made you cry when you're on earth, are you going to be able to cry in hell? And would you cry? What would make you cry in hell? This man 
still has the ability of crying. Now, is his tear ducts going to work? Is he going to get tears? I don't know. I don't know. But crying. He says in verse 24, uh, he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. The desire for mercy. That will be with people in hell. They will still desire to have mercy. Mercy. Uh, one, not what we deserve. And how do we express to God, how do we express to others when we don't want, want what we're getting or what we deserve? And, and that's not fair. Well, do, you, do you want what's fair or do you want mercy? When you cry out to God for mercy, in hell, it goes unheard. Now, in your life, right now, the Bible says, is a day of salvation. God offers you an opportunity to call on him for mercy. In Romans chapter 10, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and uh, that's the way you get saved, Romans 10, 13. And you call out on God and ask him to forgive you for your sins. Why? Because you don't want the punishment that comes with those sins. How many of us in our whole lifetime, and I've worked in jails, I work in psychiatric hospitals, I worked in, in nursing homes and all kinds of places in my years of ministry, I've never run across anybody that said, God, I want what I deserve. We don't want what we deserve. We want God's mercy. And this man in hell is crying out for mercy. God has a lot of mercy. He wants to give you mercy, but he wants to give it to you on this side of the grave, not on the other side of the grave. And it'll just fall on death ears. But he has a desire. He understands mercy, and he wants to get some of it. Then look at the next one in, in, in uh, verse 24. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tips of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Does he have the ability to taste? I, I, my chiropractor says I shouldn't do it, but I like distilled water. And to me, distilled water tastes good. Uh, bo some bottled water seems to taste good. Water doesn't have a lot of flavor in it. But have you ever tasted really good cool, clean water. And uh, th this, this man, this man in hell, wants to taste, wants to cool the relief of, of on his tongue, tasting. Uh, they say we have five senses. Some people say more than five senses. In this story, it reveals a number of them that's still working, seeing, smelling, tasting. Uh, and, and so uh, here's tasting. And uh, he wants to Cool my tongue. And why does he want his tongue cool? That it, it seems like he wants a tip of his finger, one finger, in water and put it on his tongue. Anything to get relief. And it says, for I am tormented. I am tormented in this flame. Now, the flame is number six on your outline. Being in hell, seeing, crying, desiring mercy, tasting, and flames. According to this story that Jesus is telling, I believe it's a true account. I believe it really happened. But uh, Jesus said there's flames in fire. The man in hell is saying the flames, I'm tormented in these flames. Now what would happen if this body is subject to flames? It would just burn up. But what if we had a new body? What if we had a eternal body, or some people refer to them as a celestial body, our spiritual body, and, and a body that is designed for where we're at? And uh, he's tormented in flames. Flames is not burning him up. Some teach that we're just going to burn up, and that's going to be the end of it. I don't see that happening here, And uh, but he's in the flames and that's part of the torment. Look at verse 23. He says, and, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in that lifetime. The, the, another torment, this is number seven, 
is remembering. You will remember. Remembering doesn't stop at the cemetery or at the funeral home. When the doctor pronounces you dead, the Bible teaches that there's life after death and you have the ability to remember. Now, what is it you remember? Abraham says you're going to remember Lazarus. You're going to remember your life. You're going to remember opportunities. How about if you remember this sermon? And I don't know you personally, but I'm saved and I'm freed. I'm from the penalty of sin. Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross, freed me from that. And so what do I need to remember? I need to remember Jesus. I need to remember what he did. But can you imagine being in hell and remembering your life, your opportunities, when you did this thing, when you should have done this thing, when you said no to God, when you should have said yes to God, when God came and pulled you and tugged you in your heart and you didn't surrender to him, you didn't say, yes, Lord, save me. And the way people get saved, it's simple for us, is you ask him to save you. And uh, he did all the hard stuff. You get the easy stuff. Ask him to save you because you don't want to go to this place. There's stories in the book of Acts. There's stories in the Bible about people who got real close to getting saved and then didn't get saved or we don't have an account of them being saved. Can you imagine them in hell remembering almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian is what one man said and then shrugged it off. I had a man, I shared the gospel with him, and he said, I don't need anybody to die for me. I'll take it. I'll do it, I'll do it myself. I'm, I'm good enough to do it myself. And I said, remember that. You remember that your whole life. Now, what's going to happen? You're going to remember the good things, the bad things, but remembering isn't going to save you. But one of the torments in the place called hell, is remembering. At 70 years old, my memory isn't as good as it once was, but in hell, you're going to have a good memory. You're not going to be able to stop remembering. What a torment. What a torment. Jesus doesn't want you to go through that. That's why he says, that's why he's telling us this, and that's why he's saying, in a sense, please don't go to a place called hell. He came here. He was born. He lived. He died on the cross. He was rose, rose again from the dead three days later and ascended into heaven. Why? Because he doesn't want you to go to hell. Please, whatever you do, don't go to hell. Number eight goes down in verse 26. Abraham still talking. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. I use the word trapped. For all eternity, if you go to hell, you're going to spend eternity in a place called torment, a place of torment. He's trapped. You have the option now in your life to make a lot of decisions. I want to do this, I want to do that, and that's okay. But when you go to hell, you don't have the option. When I worked in some certain jails, and I talked to them, and I said, oh, I wish I could get out. Oh, I wish. I, I had lunch one day in a, in a cell block in Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, and uh, I ate some stale bread and some green bologna and had mustard on it and some lukewarm Kool-Aid, and it was terrible. And I ate it because they invited me to, and I, I was there. So I ate the lunch and uh, had the Bible study. And, and when I got ready to leave, uh, some of the, the, the inmates said, uh, Dr. Kershey, where are you going? When you leave here today, where are you going? And I kind of joked with them, but I was serious. I said, I'm going right down the street to McDonald's to get some hamburgers to get this taste out of my mouth. And uh, I, I, I wasn't trapped. And they just, oh, oh, we can't believe you're going to do that. We can't believe. I, I could come and go as I pleased. I could come into the jails. I could get out of the jails. And, uh, you know, so I, I wasn't afraid. But in hell, 
you're trapped. You want to go? You can't go. You can't come over here. We can't come over there. There's a great golf fixed. <clears throat> and in verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father. Isn't that amazing that one of the torments I see in a place called hell is the ability to pray? <coughs> Excuse me. I see a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. And uh, they, they don't want to pray. They don't see the necessity of prayer. Uh, my late wife would go to the, she was a chaplain at the hospital, and she would go around, and she weighed about 100 pounds, not quite 100 pounds, and she'd go up to people and say, you wouldn't mind if I pray with you, pray for you, would you? And nobody ever turned her down. Uh, they turned me down if I asked them, can I pray for you? Do you mind if I pray for you? But she, my little wife, Jeanette, she never got turned down of people who wanted her to pray for them. One day, you're going to be able to pray. Even in hell, you're going to pray. And he says, uh, where was it in verse 27? And he said, I pray thee, therefore. Can you imagine prayer? I've had people tell me, it sounds like my prayers only go to the ceiling. They don't get any further than the ceiling. They go up and bounce down. I prayed and asked God for something, and I didn't get it. So I quit praying. Well, maybe you got the wrong concept about prayer. Prayer is about changing, but not changing God, changing us. And uh, over my years as a Christian, I have learned that God wanted to mold and make and shape me. And if I shake my finger at him and tell him what he's supposed to do, I, I usually don't get a good response in prayer. What am I supposed to do? Talk to me, tell me, lead me. And uh, this man is praying in hell. He's praying. It's not doing him any good. Not helping him at all. And then in, in verse 28, look what he says. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He cares about his loved ones. Now, five brothers, apparently six boys in the family. One of them dies. Was he the oldest one? I don't know. I don't know all the details, and there's a lot of details that aren't in this story, but we can speculate he had five brothers that were home, and they didn't believe. They hadn't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And where was the natural course going to take them? They were going to wind up with their brother in hell if they didn't do something. He has a concern for his family. I speculated one time, perhaps he had a conversation with his brothers and told them, oh, don't worry about hell. There's no such place. Now he has a concern for his brothers. He doesn't want them to come. Kind of like with Jesus. Jesus is teaching this lesson. Please don't go to hell. Is he wanting his brothers not to come be with him? He doesn't want his brothers to come to a place called hell. Please <coughs> don't go to hell. Please don't. And he cared about his brothers. Also, he says, lest they come to this place. How about influence? <coughs> Does he have any influence over his brethren? Maybe in life he had some influence. Now, where's his influence? Can he exercise any influence in hell? Can you get special treatment? Can you get a special phone call? Uh, people in jail. I, I get one phone call. I want one phone call, they say. And... Uh, but, but your influence, what was his influence when he was alive? Is he going to remember? Is he going to be tormented with it? Now he wants to exercise some influence the other way, but it's limited on what he can do. And he wants Abraham to uh, do something. Stop my brothers from coming to this place. Why? It was a place of torment. Multiple torments. 
And I don't know if we know all of the torments. I'm just listing some of them that I see here. And it says in verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, Thou have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. You know what he's saying? They got the Bible. The Bible's right there. Why don't they listen to the Bible? You influence from evil. The Bible influence them for good. They have the Bible. But listen to what this man in hell is saying. Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. He's arguing with Abraham. Abraham's telling them the truth. They got the Bible. What, 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 what more do they need? Look at what the Bible has to say. And he says, no, no, that's not enough. The Bible is not enough. The argument is still there. In hell, being in torment, he still thinks he knows what's best. He still thinks he has a better plan and, uh, and laid out. But uh, it, it's not what happens. And he says, if one goes from the dead, they would repent. Now, th this is somewhere in Jesus' ministry. We know that Jesus ministered for about three years. And uh, uh, after he died and came back from the dead, it, did, did this man know that? Did this man know in hell that God's plan was somebody dying and coming back from the dead? Was he speaking that from experience? Where did he learn that from? Jesus died. I had a man tell me one time, uh, Preacher, don't talk to me about eternity. Nobody died and came back and told us what it was like. And I said, oh, you're so wrong. You are so wrong. That's the basis of the Christian message. Jesus Christ died and came back. He rose again to tell us, to assure us, that there is a place called heaven, that there is eternity, that there is life after death. Listen to the last verse. And he says unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will be they persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the dead. Has everybody been persuaded because of that? I hear people want to argue about it all the time. Well, he just fainted. He just did this. He, his, his disciples stole him away and, and all of this. Uh, the Bible says that at one time, after the resurrection, after he died and came back, one time 500 people saw him. And when it was being written, he said, most of those people are still alive now. They're not still alive today. But there was 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you could have interviewed back then. I think it's a well-documented case. But you know what happens if you go to hell? The worst torment. The worst torment of all this is you go without Christ. You can accept Christ as your Savior. Christ is available. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. The provision is for everybody. If you go to hell, you're going to spend eternity in hell without Jesus. And you don't have to. Why else did Jesus tell this story? One, one, one guy told me that Jesus told this story for us to be accountable for what we do. Stewardship. Well, there's a stewardship element here, but he doesn't want you to go to hell. Jesus spoke to you and me about a place called hell. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Being in hell, seeing, crying, desiring mercy, tasting the flames, remembering, being trapped, praying, caring for loved ones, having an influence, and without Christ. Those are 12 torments that I see in this passage. You may read it and find some. Please, don't go to hell. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message that you have in your word. And Father, it's just straight and simple and plain. We thank you for it. And there is a place called hell that we should avoid. There is a place of heaven that we should claim in the name of Jesus and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Father, help those that are listening to this today accept you as their Savior. 
In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.